our uh, worship time today as uh, Paul and company, they meet Lydia and the women down by the river to pray. But I wanna take us back a moment where we have been and I'm going to share a map this morning. And if some of you can give me a thumbs up, a map is a has appeared on your screen, thank you. Um, so the last two Sundays, we have explored Barnabas and Paul's first missionary journey from Antioch to the, uh, from Jerusalem to Antioch to Cyprus, to the island of Cyprus, to Derby and Lystra and back to Antioch. And then last week, we read about Acts 15 where Paul and Barnabas had a falling out. They had a disagreement over whether to take Barnabas's cousin, John Mark, along with them. And they had a falling out about that decision. And Barnabas ends up taking John Mark and heads east to spread the good news. And that is the last we hear of the story of Barnabas. The book of Acts now follows the journeys of Paul. As he returns to Derby and Lystra where Barnabas and Paul started these faith communities and they were checking in on them. And then the beginning of Acts 16, tells us that Paul and his companions traveled throughout the region of Phrygia and Galatia. In this area here. And they're traveling on foot. Maybe they have some other means of travel, but a lot of it I believe is on foot. And then one night Paul has a vision where a man begs him to come help in Macedonia. And they leave Troas, which is over here near the coast and sailed to Samothrace and Neapolis. And eventually they end up in Philippi in Northern Greece. So that's your geography lesson for today to orient you to where we are geographically in scripture. Paul Walaske in his commentary on Acts says that Paul's journey takes him from Judaism's religious center into Greece's intellectual center and eventually to Rome's political center. Paul and Silas were entering the birthplace of Greek literature and philosophy of Homer, Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, and Alexander the Great. So that sets where we are in history as well as geographically. Upon their arrival in Philippi, Paul and his companions seek out a community of prayer. They are wanting to find kindred spirits with whom they could share the message of Jesus. Paul somehow miraculously, intuitively goes down to the river. Maybe that is what one is to do when in a new community is down to the river to pray. And there they find a group of women praying. These women had gone outside the gates of the city down to the river to pray. It wasn't a traditional religious site. There was no synagogue, no temple, but open air worship in God's creation. Kind of like what we experienced last week when we held the sacrament of baptism. It was open air worship and it was beautiful and glorious. According to Jewish tradition, 10 Jewish men were required to form a synagogue. So perhaps in the city of Philippi, there were not enough Jews to meet this minimal threshold, or it is possible the city barred any unauthorized religions within the city gates. So the women find themselves outside the city gates down by the river to pray. 
Among this group of women was what scripture tells us is a worshiper of God. We heard this once before in the book of Acts about Cornelius. Cornelius also was a worshiper of God, suggesting that they were not Jewish themselves, but affiliated with a Jewish community. The text in Acts 16 also offers another important detail. Lydia was also from the city of Thyatira, which was in that region near Macedonia, and a dealer in purple cloth. So she is now making her home across the sea in Philippi from Thyatira. What this dealer of purple cloth tells us about Lydia is that she is a woman of means. She is a businesswoman. In the ancient world, only wealthy people could afford to purchase purple cloth. It was worn as a sign of nobility. Hebrew scriptures also tell us that purple cloth was to be used in creating the tabernacle of God. Imperial purple was also called Tyrian purple. It was created from the excretions of predatory sea snails. It took hundreds of snails to extract enough dye for just a few yards of cloth. That's a lot of snails, poor snails. In fact, the snails apparently almost went extinct from overproduction because purple was so valued across the Mediterranean. And Thyatira, where Lydia is from, was famous for its artisans creating the most desirable shade of purple. Lydia apparently had enough wealth to buy into a franchise of expensive purple dye and then traveled from Turkey to Northeast Greece to establish her, her business in the Roman city of Philippi. We can imagine that she may well have been raised to worship the gods and goddesses of Thyatira, but at some point she became a worshiper of God, a God fearer. As a successful businesswoman, Lydia still makes time for regular worship. She makes the weekly trek outside the city gates and goes down to the river to pray with the other women. You too make the weekly trek to worship. You trek all the way to your computer or iPad or phone and Maybe you even take it down to the river to pray. I see that Angie is outside where our fountain is. So she has her own water source there. When Paul and Silas show up, she was, Lydia was open to the words of this wandering preacher who had put his hope in Jesus. And she opened her heart to the presence of God and to the presence of Jesus in her midst. And she makes the decision for herself and um, to be baptized. And scripture tells us that her whole household was baptized. Hopefully she did not make the decision on their behalf. Hopefully they made their own decision to be baptized, but scripture tells us they were all baptized. In verse 15, some translations say that Lydia then prevailed upon Paul and his companions to accept hospitality in her home. Other translations use the word invited instead of prevailed. There is one other place in the New Testament where the word prevailed is used. It's in Luke 24 on the road to Emmaus on Easter evening, that first Easter evening, Cleopas and the unnamed disciple prevail upon the risen Jesus to stay with them that night. Do you remember that story? They were involved in this rich conversation and Cleopas and the unnamed disciple did not want it to end. And they say, please come in and eat with us. And then their eyes were open to who this stranger was. They prevailed upon Jesus. Lydia prevails upon Paul and Silas. Lydia's invitation is a verbal echo of lives transformed and opened in faithful discipleship. She welcomes these men into her home and provides for them. One has to wonder how large her home was that we don't know how many companions were traveling with Paul. Most Bibles refer to this passage 
there's sometimes little headers in the Bibles that you use. In the header for the Bible that I opened for this passage, it refers to it as Lydia's conversion in Philippi. But as in other stories in Acts, I asked the question, and you might too, who was converted? Who needs to be converted? Who was converted? Who was saved that day? We, that question came up with the baptism of the Ethiopian eunuch. Who was it that was converted or saved? The question came up when Saul was converted. Who needed to be converted? Was it Saul or was it the way that people looked at a newly transformed Saul? And now I ask the question about Lydia and now Saul turned Paul. I wonder if it was more than Lydia and her household being saved that day. Is it possible that Paul and his companion saved Lydia through Jesus Christ? But also that Lydia and her household saved Paul and his friends and companions. Perhaps they save each other in Christian mutuality and the radical welcome and hospitality of God. Because after this story in Acts, Paul and Silas, we'll read about this next week, so um, this is your teaser. Paul and Silas are arrested and thrown in jail in Philippi. They will return to the home and hospitality of Lydia, who opens her doors once again. Would Paul and his companions have been able to survive their near-death experience and other harrowing experiences that they will, they will have without the financial support and without the hospitality of Lydia and her household? Author Marg Mosco writes, Lydia's hospitality and her benefaction of Paul and his ministry required courage. Having a group of foreign men stay in her home could cause scandal. In addition, hosting worship of a new Jewish Messiah and not an emperor or any of the ancient respected pagan gods could have ruined her reputation and her business. There's another part about this story that intrigues me. The author of Acts of the Apostles does not tell us about Lydia's marital status. And I love that it is ambiguous. We do not know. She might have a husband. She might be divorced. She might be single. We do not know. Who was this independent woman who goes beyond the boundaries set for her in a time when women were often seen as property rather than people who owned property or a business as Lydia did? Who was this Gentile woman who sought the God of Judaism? This text paints a picture of an independent, powerful, influential businesswoman of means who owns her own business and who was capable of making her own decisions without having to consult a man. In a world and a time where women's voices were generally discounted, nevertheless, Lydia persisted. She persisted in a way to prevail upon Paul to receive her generous hospitality. She welcomed strangers in a place where she had once been a stranger offering her hospitality and generosity. Come and stay, she says. If you have judged me to be faithful, it turns out that the first act of discipleship for a new follower of Jesus is not proselytizing. The first act of discipleship is hospitality. Opening our hearts, opening our homes. Lydia becomes the first European Gentile convert and builds the first Christian church on Greek soil, welcoming other new believers into the faith. 
both her position in commerce and her knowledge of faith made her uniquely qualified to be a leader in the church in Greece. Lydia is one of the spiritual mothers of the faith, an example of how prominent women were in the early years of the church. So who is it that receives blessing in this story? Who is being saved? We have two leaders of two spiritual communities, Lydia and Paul. They meet and they recognize that they need each other. Lydia needs what Paul has to offer in his experience of the risen Christ. It turns out Paul needs Lydia's hospitality. Paul is called over the waters and ultimately finds renewal and blessing from Lydia's household. So what can we glean from Paul's writings to the churches what we can glean um, from his later writings to the churches that he helped to build is that the church in Philippi becomes one of Paul's favorite faith communities. It's like a parent, you say you don't have a, a favorite, but when we read the book of Philippians, we can feel Paul's love for this faith community where he says, Every time I think about you, I lift you up to God and I give thanks. And perhaps it is Lydia's financial support and hospitality that makes Paul's ministry possible. This story is a good reminder of, of humility as well as hospitality. It offers a glimpse of how shared resources and, and willingness to offer hospitality can create sacred community grounded in mutuality and shared blessing. Two years ago, Reverend Jake Miles Joseph of Fort Collins United Church of Christ preached on this text following the death of Jean Vanier. Some of you may remember that Vanier was the one who started the Larsh community uh, where Laura Giddings um, is a community leader at Larsh Tahoma Hope here in Tacoma. Um, Vanier started the Larsh community uh, where people with and without intellectual disabilities live together in community. Vanier studied how people with mental disabilities were being treated and he resolved to create a community where they could live with one another in dignity. By living together, Vanier said he truly began to understand what it meant to be human. Following Vanier's death two years ago, the New York Times carried an obituary of his life with an unfortunate title. So listen to how this title plays on your, on your mind. Jean Vanier, savior of people on the margins. Just like many Bibles refer to our passage in Acts 16 as Lydia's conversion in Philippi, this headline about Jean Vanier doesn't tell the whole story. Vanier and the large model of Christianity would say that it is actually the opposite. Vanier wasn't the savior of those living at the margins. He was the one who was saved. My own personal experience of this yesterday is when Angie and I joined a friend um, down in the Willamette Valley. Um, our friend Lisa, who I went to seminary with 20 years ago, um, she turns 50 next year. She was recently diagnosed with MS and um, she decided that she was going to do a fundraiser um, for MS. And not only was she going to raise money, she was going to bike it and she was going to do the 20 mile ride. And I looked at the date and Angie and I talked and we thought, hey, we could go and support Lisa. We never thought that we would be her savior, but we thought we'll go and support Lisa on this ride. And she said, if you come, if you do this, I think I'll, I'll change my ride from 20 miles to 38 miles. 
um, because I'll feel your support and I'll feel like I can go farther with you along. And so, so we went on this bike ride in the beautiful Willamette Valley near Western Oregon University. And while my sit bones may still be recovering, I am also basking in the blessing and inspiration of sharing that ride with my dear friend, Lisa, whom I have not seen in over two years. So we went to support her, but the blessing was about reconnection and renewed friendship and receiving inspirational stories. And so when we give of ourselves and we think that we're going to help out and we're going to be such a blessing to other people because we have so much to give, it's good to often be reminded that the blessing is actually coming to us in the other direction. And it's about mutual blessing. It's not just one direction, it goes both ways. Our faith is about receiving hospitality from unexpected sources with grace. When we let go of our need to help or save others and just open ourselves to the unexpected gifts other people can offer us, there is sometimes shared mutual blessing. The household of God is rooted in mutuality. That is how those who support large communities understand church. Where do you find mutuality? and blessing in your faith today? What are the blessings coming your direction from unexpected places? And if you would like, I invite you to turn to the chat to share whatever those experiences might be in sharing some of those places. Your experiences also inspire us and bless us. So um, I invite you to do that if, if you would like. In offering hospitality, in sharing gospel hope, in living in community with those whom many have rejected, we are not only giving to God, but it is also how we truly become Christians living in mutual need of one another. We need the gifts of those whom we serve as much as they need us. Reverend Stephen Garnis Holmes, one of my favorite clergy poets to quote, um, wrote this about this text. A seller of purple cloth, a strong woman by the name of Lydia appears. The waters flowed down to the sea as Phoenician ships plied their trade, taking her dyed materials of this deep purple shade. God opens her heart and she is transformed. She welcomes the stranger turned newfound friend to into her home and offers hospitality. The transformed one, the welcoming one prevails. Let us join Lydia and others to go down to the river to pray, recognizing that the river is here 